to be all in end all, right? So you'll get some um, insight uh, into uh, landowners in your state, and these are statewide data. Uh, they can't be parsed down to the uh, to the actual area that you're working in. Uh, but so you know, you'll think about what you think about landowners here versus statewide, um, and it's just another part of the sort of information channel that you have, right? So uh, you also, you know a lot about landowners in your area. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time this afternoon in the work groups thinking through that. What else do you know about these people to really define who they are, what we call profiling, which has a bad name, but it just means everything you know about these people. So this is part of that equation, okay? Um, and I'm going to show both Connecticut and New York. Most cases, there's not too much of a difference, but there are some interesting differences. Okay? And then we'll just talk a little bit about, um, you know, this ring true to you kind of thing. So I'm going to do the first half of this. Part of it's going to pick up on the second half, and then we'll sort of get a sense from you folks in terms of how much of this seems right for this area and, and how much may seem a little bit more like it's different from it. Okay, and I can go on. This is all based on the National Woodland Owners Survey. I don't think you want this lights on. Thank you. Okay, so this is all based on the National Woodland Owners Survey, conducted by the Forest Service. It's an extremely robust survey. Um, it asks about 26 or so questions, varying formats. Um, they're really trying to get at who owns the private lands in the United States, why do they own them, what are they doing with it, what are their plans for the future. Um, and they are uh, also, for the first time on this program, going to be able to look at some trends over time. It wasn't possible uh, in the past because, um, although there's been some form of this since 1952, uh, Methods have changed from time, from one uh, period to another, different researches and so forth. And back in the early days, it wasn't in people's minds so much scientifically in terms of standardization. So now they're really paying attention to that. Uh oh, what was that? Uh oh. All right. We have this under our. Okay. Um, no, this is not in your workbook. You will. We will hand out some of the data sheets for um, for your states after I talk. I do not like people looking at flipping through things related to what I'm talking about. <laughs> <up. laughs> You'll get, you'll get it, you'll get it, right? Um, so the way this is conducted, for those of you who uh, are going to want to know about methodology, is have anybody heard of the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program? Probably not. A couple of people. So the U.S. Forest Service has a whole branch of their research. By the way, they have the largest uh, forestry research organization in the world. Um, and one part of that has... Uh, focused on trying to understand what's happening with forests throughout the country, both on private and public lands. So they've done this uh, research for quite a long time. They originally were looking at timber, so some of the earlier um, uh, studies were very timber focused, but now it's much broader. So they have one permanent plot about every 6,000 acres throughout, across the country. That varies. It's a little bit different in the West than in the East, but that's pretty much the way it is. Um, and they look at every, they're on about a five to seven year cycle. They look at what the tree, what the composition of the forest is like, how it's growing over time. They look at biomass now. They're looking at carbon sequestration now. They look at forest health. They look at a subset of plots. They look at soils. Um, things like um, invasives, insects, so it's pretty comprehensive. And if you really ever want to know any of those uh, data, 
they produce reports and also data is available. You can you can get it from the Forest Service for your research if you are so inclined. Now for every one of those plots, if it falls on a private no, for every one of those plots, somebody goes and finds out who owns the land. Um, and even if they have to go to the town hall, which in some parts of the country, couldn't guess where, you <laughs> have to do that. <laughs> um, or the county office, wherever it happens to be. And if it's a private landowner, they get a survey. And the response rate on that survey, uh, for this last go around, was 43%. It's a very good response rate, excellent as a matter of fact. Um, so that's what you're going to see. That's kind of the background of how this is all done. Um, how do you define a forest? So the forest, U.S. Forest Service has a definition um, that has to do with uh, so many trees per acre. So it just looks at tree cover. Um, and it's pretty sparse because they also include some of the forests out west that are more uh, what we might call savanna chaparral kind of forest, they're also included. So I think it's one, 10 trees per acre is, is the number. Yes? So how do they differentiate um, a forest from a tree farm if they're just going to cover it? Say that again? How do they differentiate a tree farm from a forest if they're just going by coverage? How do you define a tree farm? Well, a, a mono, mono, you know, culture of trees. Uh, you know? Everything is included. So then they do. When they do their plots, they identify that as a plantation, uh, pretty much. They would not include Christmas tree farms, for example. But they do include uh, pine plantations in the south, of course, because yes. they're a big part of forest cover. Yeah. And they are a certain type of forest, you know. They're so not we're not necessarily same. talking about the best sort of forest. We're talking about they're talking about all forests. The okay. entire expanse of forest, best is a value judgment, right? <laughs> so you think it's best, you know. Um, from a biodiversity point of view. You need this stuff, right? And you need some pine plantations to give you this stuff. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all value-based. You know, uh, what's, the, what's the objective? So yes, they're looking at uh, areas with tree cover. Um, okay, how do you define a uh, family forest owner? Uh, those are, uh, it's owned by individuals, families, family trusts, estates, all of that is included. So it's, it's pretty good. The other kinds of private landowners get the surveys, they, the data, uh, the Forest Service has the data, they've never really done anything with it, I know it's on their list of things to try to figure out, but those would be the industrial lands, TMO, corporate lands, um, uh, land trusts. <laughs> has anybody here ever gotten a survey, your land trust? No, but it's possible. Um, universities. Clubs, lots of hunting clubs, especially this part of the of the country, own land. So all those other kinds of landowners um, are excluded from the data we're going to show you, but um, they also get surveys. Okay. It's a self-administered survey, a, a mail survey. This year, this time around, which was the 2011 through 13 cycle, they did have an option to take it online, and very few people took that option. So that says something about your population, right? your general audience population. Um, they'd rather take a paper survey than an online survey was kind of at this point. Um, they do a lot of all the rigorous kind of things you need to do with surveys. You send postcards saying the survey is coming. You send the survey. If you don't get it back right away, you send a postcard reminder. If you still don't get it back, you send another survey. And after that, you try to make phone calls. So it's pretty rigorous. Um, the cooperation rate. This is, of all the surveys that we know arrived in the right place, right? then how many got returned? And so overall, 43%. You can see um, we have a pretty, we have a, we're on the higher end in the Northeast, uh, as is the Midwest and Oregon. Um, so these rates are going to vary somewhat throughout the country. They're lower in the South. They're really, so, you know, the, the, the amount of really um, what ends up being considered for us in Texas, Oklahoma, and um, New Mexico and Arizona is, and especially private lands, uh, a lot of the West is in public lands. So the number of private landowners gets smaller anyway as a, on the landscape. Um, 
Brett Butler, who runs this, I think I told you earlier, uh, is co-located at the University of Massachusetts, and he hates having to show this slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sample sizes are really important. If we're going to look at state-level data, we have to have a statistically um, a valid uh, sample size in that state. And so this is showing everybody from 10 plus acres, which is all the data we're going to show you are landowners who own 10 or more acres. We also have data for one to nine acres, but those are really a different animal. They're more that sort of urban, uh, suburban kind of forest. Bill? I got to ask. Yeah. So most, a lot of the landowners we're going to be working with, at least I'll take a guess, uh, are probably in that one to nine acre, you know, category. So there, there are probably some larger in the, as you go north. Uh, so maybe just take that into consideration as you're talking to this audience. Yeah. So for Connecticut, um, I will share with you the one to nine. Uh, landowner data, which I have separately analyzed from the 10 plus, and I do. I'm, I'm just trying to finalize that report right now, so I will get that out to through Bill to everybody, so you can see that for Connecticut. Um, my guess is it's not too different from New York. Uh, Brett will have the New York data. We can talk with him about whether he can share at this point. He's uh, he's trying to finalize all this right now from the last go around, and uh, as you might imagine, it's quite a job. So. Um, whether he's gotten to the point with the under 10 acre uh, data, whether he can share or not yet, I don't know, but we can find out. But my, I guess as a follow up, can we assume just for the, as we're going through this training, that within the one to nine acre range, you still have the four attitudinal groups oh, yes. likely? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I agree. And I can share, I can at least share with the group how that um, falls out for Connecticut. Okay. And see how it, differ, it differs. So. I can look that up over lunch and I can make sure everybody has that. Okay. Uh, go back to the sample size. Um, sample size is really important in terms of validity. So if you're if we're looking at uh, those states with under a hundred responses, uh, the, the the error bars are really large. Nobody I mean all the data that comes out is gonna show you can see the data, you can see that show the variances. Who, who's gonna look at variances? Are there any scientists in the room? Nobody. One. All right. See? So nobody looks at that. So what I'm saying is, uh, you know, if you lived in the state, Rhode Island, Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> and you pull up Rhode Island data, I'm telling you, you, you shouldn't be looking at that. Look at Southern New England. Say, all right, we're pretty much like Connecticut and Massachusetts. And, and, and. Um, so for our area here, New York has a... Um, uh, really good. Could, part of this is state size. Obviously, New York is bigger, so it's going to have a, a intrinsically a more uh, responses. So New York is great, and Connecticut is fine. But they're all within the, the okay range. Um, these are sort of generalized results. Uh, how are ownerships distributed? Size of holdings, which can really make a lot. Um, one of the, in terms of uh, what we're trying to do here. Some of the most important information is why people own their land, right? Because that's what's in their heart about their land. Um, how are they using their land? So that gives you a clue what they're already doing. Maybe the small kind of um, actions, behaviors we talked about earlier with Perma, maybe that's sort of plugging into what they're already doing and seeing if you can move them in that direction. Um, how they're managing their forest and then it doesn't say something we're going to show it. What are they concerned about? Again, so that's something that's on their mind. And then um, what are they planning to do in the future? <coughs> we also have demographics, um, which are important and interesting, but uh, we, we would say that the sort of attitudinal uh, value kind of things are more important than demographics. Uh, we don't encourage you to go down the demographic route exclusively. Okay. So here, these are going to, so we're going to show the same thing for each state as we go along. Uh, no surprise to anybody, most of the forest land in Connecticut is owned by families. Right. Right. Um, 
Um, same thing in New York. New York has a little more state land. Makes sense. A uh, little well, Connecticut has a fair amount. This is across the U.S. showing different land ownership types. The, um, uh, this kind of green here is family. You can see very strong in the south, very strong in New England and in a lot of New York. Not so much in the west. West is, this is all federal land, this kind of mustardy yellow color. Now if you, if you really zoom in here, here are certainly plenty of family landowners in these areas, but they, they're overwhelmed on the map by the public lands. Go back. Um, corporate lands, these are, anybody know what a TMO is? I think I said that once before. No. Yeah. <laughs> Timberland Investment Management Organizations. They are the, the entities that have bought up all what used to be the corporate lands, the paper company lands. International Paper, Georgia Pacific, Weyerhaeuser, Midwest Vaco, none of those companies own land anymore. West, um, Weyerhaeuser has their own type of TMO, so they've kind of separated it out. All that land is now owned by investment type organizations. They need to buy low, sell high, and get all the money they can off the timber while they're owning it. And they're very likely to sell for what they call high, highest and best use if they can. So they got lakefront property, they buy 10,000 acres, and they got 1,000 acres of lakefront property, they're going to try to sell it. They also are very amenable to conservation easements. Anything that brings money into their bottom line, because they're all about ROI, they're happy. Now that's a sort of generalization. There are some TMOs who also have a specific mission about ecological forestry and ecosystem services. So there are those, and I'm glad they're there. But they're not, by any means, the the bulk of it. So you can see Pacific Northwest has quite a lot of that. Um, Maine, almost all of northern Maine, and a fair amount down here in the south. And here, in the south, they tend more to be pine plantations, not natural forest. Okay. And ask questions as we go along. Um, what, what's the extent of what we're talking about? So in Connecticut, almost 600,000 acres of land in this 10 plus family ownership, 18,000 ownerships. Um, New York, much bigger, 10 times more. Um, pretty much in both cases, 9 million acres, almost 200,000 ownerships. So this looks at uh, size, and here is uh, Connecticut showing most of the ownerships are in the smaller acres, right? But the land is a little more distributed. Maybe we would explain how they are set up because... Yeah, these are all set up the same way. On this side, which is in gray, would be proportion of ownerships. On this side, it's proportion of acres. They're all set up the same way. This is New York. Um, Still, most are in the smaller acreages, but uh, actually, this is even more evenly distributed. So you've got a lot of the acres in the bigger categories. Okay, this is one of the more important slides: reasons for owning. Um, beauty, home, privacy, legacy, family, recreation. Hunting, these are all what I call lifestyle values. So keep that in mind. This is a lifestyle. They love living out there. They love being surrounded by trees. They love having streams and wildlife and all that goes with it. And that is their primary emotional motivation for anything. Um, you could call it love of the land, but it's, just, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's just how they identify themselves. Um, they also have a, a, a pretty high uh, on, the, on the conservation scheme. And, oh, I should have played it. So what this means is um, the survey has a question that asks them to rate each of these categories in terms of their recent ownership on a scale of one to five. So um, these are people who've rated either important or very important. So they're not mutually exclusive, they're not going to add up to 100%. So what this means is, 
90 plus percent say that beauty is an important, a very important reason for them owning their land. And on the contrary, 20 something percent says hunting is an important, a very important reason for owning their land. That's how you do this. Understand the left and the right. The left is the number of owners, and the right is the the uh, proportion of land. So um, let's just say twenty something percent of the of the owner of the land owned by owners who say the timber is important. And is this is the <coughs> are you sure the New York slide? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do we know um, response rates broken out per state? I showed you that earlier. Was it broken out by state? Oh, okay, then I missed that. Yeah, it was the map. Go ahead. Back to that. Yeah, because. Nope. Nope. So in New York, it oh, okay. was over 50%. Okay. Connecticut? Right. Over 50%. Okay. It's That's a mean, phenomenal response rate, by the way. Uh, yeah. You can get any uh, social science study published at 20% response rate. Well, even less is sometimes a very significant response rate. But um, the only th the reason I ask is because it seems to me that people who were likely to respond to the survey might also have views that they would want to communicate, such as about their land would tend to have more views, tend to be, I know you've broken out landowner types, so might be the more interested landowner, as opposed to the disinterested landowner would be also less likely, I would think, to respond. So that's, to a, that's, a, that's a great point, uh, which comes out when it comes to responder bias. So um, they do try to test for respond, response bias, and that what this gentleman is saying is that some people are more inclined to answer surveys than others, and that's for all kinds of reasons. One. They're the kind of people who just are good doobies and, you know, they don't want to do it. Two, they feel strongly about something, so they're more likely to respond. And that could go positive or negative. Um, um, and, you know, three, uh, older people who, you know, um, we try to, we, so the way you handle it is you make phone calls and you try to um, ask a smaller subset of questions over the phone to people who haven't responded. And that gives you some indication it's not perfect. Uh, some indication about whether those answers differ than the ones who actually responded. And um, we found very little difference. So that's the best you can do. So I, what I would say is for the best that they could do, there's very little difference. <coughs> what we found in Connecticut, because we did that, we really were working hard to get the sample size up in Connecticut because um, we had not had usable data up until this run. Um, so we did an intensive sampling, we had extra money to do that, and we did a lot of work on the sponsor. I mean, people would say, my husband just died, it's like, oh God, you know. <laughs> so, you know, at some point, or I can't see anymore, I'm going blind. I mean, some of these people are older and there are all these kind of reasons that they play in. So, uh, another thing about this is, so the conservation values, wildlife, nature, water, is really high. Those are all conservation values. So if you look at this, you say, okay, what's on people's minds about why they own their land? It's lifestyle and conservation values, really hard. Right? And the financial values are lower. Even land investment is kind of interesting. It's always there, but it's pretty low. Um, timber, quite low. This is, uh, oh, we showed it. We showed New York. Do you want to go back? Yeah, so there's Connecticut. So there's Connecticut. Here's New York. There's really not much difference here. And you'll have you'll have these. We'll pull in that too. Okay. Um, most people, it's part of their home. This is true for both states. Uh, the farm. There's going to be. There's a few more that also have farms in New York now. You may say, well, that's not Westchester County. That's upstate, which could be true. But you you know that better than we do. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, are you talking about second properties versus primary residence in all? Yeah, so this is what it says, part of home that's a primary residence. The home and farm would mean they have a home and a farm and they live on it. Uh, neither would be second, secondary residences. And what's the air bars on these? What are those things? Yeah, those are the uh, air bars. They're pretty good. But for, 
Not quite how do you read that? Well, how do you read them? So this says 40% of the land area is people's primary home, plus or minus about, looks like 8%. And, and what that means is that if you did this survey a hundred times, oh. 95 times, you would get a response that is plus or minus 8%. Oh. Yeah. That's the margin of error. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. These are really good. If you looked at Rhode Island, everybody's going to be on here, or Oklahoma, everybody's going to be on here. Um, how long have they been on their land? This can be sometimes important. Uh, it looks like, you know, pretty much. 10 to 50 years, it's about where the bulk of it all is. Connecticut, New York, about the same. Now, what are they doing? Now, this is not an exclusive list of what they're doing on the land. This is only what the survey is asking. So, there's always that kind of uh, limitation, right? But um, a lot of them are cutting trees for their own use. This is true of those states. Uh, that's the firewood mostly. Um, in Connecticut, uh, they are removing invasives, building trails, and some small amount, we're down to like 20% of the owners, are improving wildlife habitat. Yeah. <coughs> New York, again, firewood trails, um, wildlife habitat. This is really interesting. So, a fair number of these people are already saying 20, 30%, I'm improving wildlife habitat on my property. Well, that's a great in, right? Because, okay, what are you doing? You know, start talking to them about what else they could be doing or how they're doing it. Um, those, those are really, really great. Building trails. Now, you may not care about trails, but, you know, maybe if you, if you look at, all right, well, we just want to get that first level of interest. Why don't we get people together to talk about how you build a trail? How do you make sure it's stable and, you know, it's the best kind of trail you can build? Hey, why not? You get people in there that have the slightest bit interested in anything else, but then you can start talking about other things. Why the NTS so high in the world? Non-timber forest products. Um, yeah. What are they harvesting? Well, uh, any ideas? Maple syrup. Maple syrup. Maple syrup. Mushrooms. Mushrooms. What else? Apples. Ginseng. Ginseng. Marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Between this chart and then the other one for reasons for owning forest land. At the top of this chart says cutting trees is one of the most widely seen activity. And yet on the other one for reasons for owning land, firewood and timber about cutting trees are way towards the bottom. So you have I don't know why that is, but interesting. Okay, here's why this is. What's an important reason for owning your land? Even if you're cutting firewood. You may not say that's an important reason for owning your land, but since you do, hey, you're out there, right? So that's why you have to look at all of this. And fire was a great in with a lot of these people in New England. Um, what are they doing? Are they just taking every dead thing out of the woods? We've heard people say that. Well, that's not great for wildlife, right? So maybe you can start working with people about how to sustainably cut firewood. What's the right thing to do? You know, how do you plan that out? I doubt any much of this is planned out. Firewood cutting. That's a great answer. So I'm talking about land stewardship. Isn't this also a difference between why people what's the reasons for ownership versus what they do? Yeah, that's right. And that that I know for Massachusetts forest owners there is this uh, there may be a lack of long-term management among you know relatively small percent percentage of total owners actually manage their land under a long-term forest management plan but many of them cut when the need arises so the activity may include cutting trees for their own use for their for income mm -hmm. uh, but it may not be the reason why they're owning the land yeah I mean, cutting trees for sale this is 20 percent mm -hmm. you know they're still doing it. Um, okay let's see what else we got here I say, you ask me if I'm likely to start my exercise program next week, and I say, yes. <laughs> Check me in a couple weeks from now. Did I really do that? So, all right, keep that in context. These are stated intentions. But look at, there's still probably going to cut firewood. Wildlife is pretty big there. That's interesting. It's, it's 
more people are saying, or at least a large group are kind of measuring and thinking about what people, <coughs> what's an indicator of people actively uh, doing something with their land. Um, are they in the preferred use tax program, the whatever that's called in your state, current use tax program for forest land? In Connecticut, the number is pretty high. If you look, Connecticut minimum acres is 25, so if you looked at the 25 plus, it's I think it's 75% of those are in the current use program. Only 20% are getting advice about managing their land. 10% um, said they have an easement. Nationally, that's pretty high. Nationally, the number's great. So, um, looks like about 3% say they've, they've participated in any kind of a cost share program. That would be wildlife habitat improvement, uh, stream re restoration, those kind of things. Almost nobody's certified, and most people say, I'm not doing any of these things. Right. So one of the things is these are the traditional kind of programs we've got out there. They're very low use about standards. New York, you've got a different current use program in New York. It's more restrictive, you need at least 40 acres. It shows. You got far fewer people in it. Certification is um, um, it's a program where an independent outside auditor comes in and evaluates how you're managing your land and then certifies that you're doing it sustainably. We have that program in Yeah, well the program is available nationally. American Tree Farm is in every state, I believe. Uh, some are through the Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, and the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. The Sustainable Forestry Initiative is really only on commercial lands. The Forest Stewardship Council tends to be on commercial and conservation mm -hmm. lands both. But these programs are, they're expensive, they're onerous for small landowners, there's a lot of paperwork. We have our Yale Myers Forest certified by FSC. They come every year to do an audit, which is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, they, they probably find one or two things every year to say, oh, why aren't you doing this or that? And we have to pay a fee. So, um, you know, we keep doing it for educational purposes. It's good for our students, but we wouldn't do it otherwise. So part of the landowner was like, why would I do this? You know? it, 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 was, it was initially um, uh, started to uh, try to uh, deal with the problem of uh, for, uh, forest practices in the tropics mainly. So uh, you can find you you can find lots of products to say FSC certified. Look next time. I even bought a mouse trap in the back of a woody mouse trap that said FSC certified. Um, and that means there's certain standards met in terms of how the forest is managed and how the wood was harvested. Um, in this country, it has had a pretty good impact on commercial lands in terms of changing their practices. So they have to. And there was a lot more public attention and. So it's a way of, like any kind of auditing system, it's a way of assurity. It's not by any means perfect, but that's what the yeah. Great. Um, on the advice and the management plan, do we take that more people have not been involved in that because they weren't interested? Uh, a, B, they didn't want to spend money on it, it cost money, or C, they didn't know enough to, that it was there that they could indulge in or be a part of it. All right. So I think for the advice, what we've learned, we do a lot of focus groups, which I don't think I really mentioned earlier. Um, everybody know what a focus group is? You invite people who are like your audience to come and eight or ten people to sit around and talk with you for an hour or so about a specific set of topics. And that's how you can dig a little deeper into motivations and, and whatnot. And what we've learned in focus groups is that people say, well, I have kind of a plan in my head. I don't really need something written down, you know. Um, well, why would I need that? So part of it is that on the management plan side, on the um, on the advice side, I think some people sometimes they don't know where to turn to advice. They don't know that things are available and on offer, um, or there's a certain segment that says, "I know what I'm doing. I don't need anybody to tell me what I'm doing. I'm fine." My grandfather owned this land, my father owned it, I owned it, <coughs> you know, why do I need anybody to tell me what to do? Um, so it's kind of a mix, you know, of all of that, I think. But my guess is a good proportion of people, especially around here, just don't know it's their own. And there's another issue, 
you try to get a surface forester in Connecticut, you only have two extension foresters. And the DEP has a few other foresters. They'll take maybe a couple of hours once to go around the area. So, and they certainly couldn't do it for everybody. So we definitely have a resource constraint in the, um, in the kind of service, forestry, end of things. There, there are a fair number of consulting foresters, but these people have to make a living. Mm -hmm. Nobody's paying their salaries, so uh, unless the landowner is willing to pay them to go out on their own, they're not going to be able to do it. Yes. What about the NRCS? Don't they have? They don't they hook you up with foresters? Yeah, NRCS does, but they have heavily been focused on farmland. They, I know that they are now trying to emphasize more of the forest land, but again, that you know, if you want to do wildlife habitat improvement, uh, they've got programs for that. I think they're. We tested in Connecticut people's awareness of these programs is it's zilch. So part of it is that people are not even aware that these things are out there. Um, yeah, but NRCS I think is our at least they have money. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the, that's the partner that, uh, that nobody's here for us yet. I think that's a partner you people should be thinking about it. <laughs> because. Um, you know, they're the ones that are going to be able to have the funds. Yeah. Okay, a couple of things. NRCS, yes, we've worked with. Okay. And I did not consider the paperwork then an office. But then again, I'm used to doing that kind of paperwork. Uh, the second thing is that many of the land trusts right now, since a lot of them are looking at accreditation, mm -hmm. we're doing all these management plans. Mm -hmm. We have this weapon to almost show these private landowners that. See, this is what one looks like. This is what you get out yeah, of it. Yeah. Here's a guy you could go to, mm -hmm. especially if you're really happy with him. Mm -hmm. uh, in most cases, I, I think this is going to be the uh, consulting, uh, consulting foresters. Yes, you're right. The Connecticut Circus Forester, yeah, lots of luck. I'm probably down for, let's see, 2025? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, we did a workshop on this for the New York uh, Forestry <laughs> Department. And their service forces were all there, and all they could talk about was they couldn't take on any more work. Yeah. So it's the same in most states. Um, I think in terms of, we, you know, Grandma talked about price. This is a real dollar sign to get a management oh, yeah. plan done by a consultant. And, you know, you have to, the, the, the benefit has to be higher than that price. Both the, the actual dollar price and the time and resource, uh, energy cost. We're kind of pulling a sneaky deal in Northern Fairfield County. Because what we've done is we've contracted for one service forester, but he's doing it for six different land trusts. So he's got somewhat of a guarantee of, here's a bunch of business. So our price is considerably better than it would be yeah. Yeah. So you've done if you're doing it on an individual basis. But that is a way to perhaps save some real money. Okay. Now, what are they worried about? What's on their mind? And of course, we present them with a list. So if you ask them cold, it's, you know, it's not quite clear how this works out. Okay, you give me a list that says, you know, what are you concerned about? There's taxes on the list. I don't know anybody who wouldn't check out our So um, I'm not saying ignore that totally, but there's probably not a whole lot you can do about that. Except in New York, you might be able to, you know, the, the New York policy for this uh, current use property tax program is more onerous than it is in many other states, not just Connecticut, many others. So that's something that you know you might consider at some point. Um, legacy. Why don't you flip to the one quickly? <coughs> so legacy and uh, what I call sort of uh, outside external. Influences are really high in most states. Trespassing, mm. vandalism, insects, water pollution. People are worried about things coming at them. Right? <laughs> um, and they're really concerned about how they can keep their land intact and pass it on to future generations. That's really important. <coughs> I don't understand. What's the difference between insects and invasive, oh, invasive plants? So not invasive yeah. insects? Or yeah. So no, like, well, insect. The, the question is, uh, insects and diseases meaning affecting your forest health. Oh, oh, like Lyme disease. Well, what we got here? We had Asian lowerbird beetle to worry about. We got emerald ash borer. We got emerald woolly adelgid. Now, if they're hearing about any of that stuff, that would mean, you know, they might be taking that off. Okay. And if you don't know, you can't get in the head of the person who's going out the survey. Not sure. 
in these questions, are people able to choose more than one answer? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. They rate, in fact, they're asked to rate each one of these on a scale of one to five. What, I'm sorry, you said something about New York, is more onerous, something about taxes, right? Yeah, so um, the property tax system, where if you keep your land in open space, and it varies by state, but let's say in wooded land, um, you get a lower tax rate if you agree to do that. And there are all kinds of conditions around that. In Connecticut, the minimum acreage is 25 acres, and you just have to agree not to develop it for 10 years. If you do, you get some kind of a penalty, right? And by doing that, you get a much lower uh, tax rate, assessed value, and your taxes are lower. No, no, it's a state law. 25 acres is state law. No, it's 25. It's 25. Your town may do something separate. Okay, but statewide it's 25 acres. In New York, the minimum acreage is 40. So right off the bat, you got people who can't qualify. And then you have to have certain kind of a management plan and do kind of certain kind of activities, come in to do certain kind of management activities, which you don't have to do in Connecticut, let's say. Now, in a state like in the South, like I don't know if I'm going to pick one, I'm not sure this is exactly true, but a lot of Southern states, you don't have to do anything. As long as it's in the woods, your tax rates are automatically lower. So, the, and in Wisconsin, you have to agree to sell timber on a certain schedule. So, these uh, state, every state has something and they go from really easy to get into. You know, if you own high winds in Texas, you're taxed at three dollars an acre no matter what, until it's, you know. And in Wisconsin, <coughs> you have to have a management plan, you have to agree to sell timber. So, and in New York, it's somewhere in the middle. So, gentlemen, next door, it's sort of answer the question. Here's, this is different. You're not talking about conservation easements. No. Nope. You're, you're talking about something. What about property, property taxes? Oh. Well, conservation easements change property. Well, they do. Right. Yeah, well, so. right, right, yeah. But this is different. This is <laughs> this is a statewide um, <clears throat> program for conserving open space. Um, is it called current use in this? In Vermont, they call it current use. They call it current use in Connecticut. I don't know what they call it in New York exactly. 480. <laughs> 480, yeah. There's only a law in that. 490 in Connecticut. I used to know, but I forgot. Okay, so um, I know some of you are working on, on water, watershed stuff, right? So you're concerned about water pollution. This is all supposed to be as it affects their land, but it's hard to tell what frame of mind people are in when they answer these questions, but they put water pollution pretty high. Yeah. <coughs> um, wildfire is higher than climate change. So this just gets to... You know, climate change is a complex topic. You, you all, you know, this is part of what you're trying to do here. It's hard to understand and to think about how is that going to affect my land. You know, it's really hard to get specific about that. Wildfires, they see the news and forests in Montana are burning up or whatever, and then it's like, oh my god, I wonder if my woods are going to burn. Well, no. You know what? New England, New York, woods are pretty it's fire resistant, at least right now. Um, but people are more worried about fire than they are about climate. So you, that's a barrier you've got to overcome in your work. If you're trying to, if you're trying to talk to landowners about climate resilience, you got to, you got to, a lot of friction, <laughs> a lot of friction, and the slide is kind of like this, right? So you have to think about that. But how are you doing? You think that's even by upstate? I mean, yeah, you, you just always you, you've got to figure that out. Yeah. You know, I think that in Westchester, climate change would burn higher than the which is what they like. To do with the, their land, yeah, because we can't see the data. But, but people might be worried about climate change in general. But in terms of how it's going to affect their actual property, I don't know. You, you, and that's one thing you might have to figure out how to sense out. My, my sense is that, and don't get me wrong when I say that it, it's not going to matter too much because, given all that's been spoken of before, you don't, don't want to go in beating that drum anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it's scary sure. enough and we see yeah. enough of it already. Yeah. Even that even hints mm -hmm. at that is going to bring up all of this. So we've got lots of other stuff that will lead into Absolutely. into that mm -hmm. exactly. so and, and you don't want to say anything about wildfire you just ignore wildfire. It's just a perceived risk that's really not good. Yeah. 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 
the other thing to note here is that this does not say anything about how intensively people feel about any of these things. It says about how many people see this as important. So for, it could be that for even if it's 20, 30 percent, for those 30 percent, climate change is a really big deal. Right? So we don't know anything about how intensively people feel about these things. But also, this data, I mean, now it's faded. I mean, I think that if you did this now, the, the storm would be higher ranked up there. And um, I just, you know, just possibly, because in the past, um, you know, maybe five years. Maybe. This was 2013, some of this. The, the surveys were collected between 2011 and 2013. Yes. Our way of just their concerns, these are generalizations. Mm -hmm. And again, you said you have some data about the, the smaller people, but is there, are we going to talk about techniques of eliciting these concerns? Yes, so Ben's question was are we going to actually talk about how to elicit from the landowners in your target audience when they're concerned about That's, you know, the, the group work starting after lunch, going through all tomorrow, is all about how you do those kind of things, how you think through. You know, here are my landowners, here's my target audience. How do I learn as much as I can about them? How do I find out what their concerns are? We're going to be talking a lot about that. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about it. It was made one statement that you didn't want us to think about demographics necessarily. However, in some of the data that you showed about land ownership between 10 and 50 years, um, you have, if you can get to some of the data, about the landowners with holding onto land. They start talking about intergenerational issues. And I know as land trusts, we have, um, that's one of the things that we get against a lot. Um, I don't want to do anything now. Um, you know, and, and, and then where do you take that conversation? Um, so there is some elements about demographics yeah. here. Um, and then where do you go to get some of that data? I know in our little townhouse, I can get some of that data from the assessor who knows you know, a lot of the property owners, and there's only 25 of them in our town. Um, but so this relates to demographics, and then also as to strategies and barriers, as you say. Yes, that's exactly. And I don't mean to totally ignore demographics, but I guess what I meant was don't only think about demographics when you're thinking about targeting your audience. Just don't just say, I'm going to target everybody over 50 years old. Well, that's not as helpful as it could be, I guess, what I'm saying. But don't ignore it, because legacy is really high on the list of concerns. It's huge. It's huge. Um, by the way, um, nobody ever wants to believe this, but these charts and concerns, and especially the reasons for owning, they're the same almost everywhere across the country. Very little difference. A few things bop up and down. Firewood will move, hunting will move, pretty much nothing else. Did you get any, any information on a vote Republican or Democrat? No, we don't. <laughs> 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 we don't know political affiliation. Well, well, because I think that's possible. It is. So, in your work group, when you're doing audience profiling, think about that. You know, in my area, are they mostly conservative Republicans? Are they mostly liberal Democrats? You know, we talk about. You know, is it NPR or Fox News? I mean, all those kind of things you'll be talking about in your group. We'll push you to make sure you get all that out. You know, that's really all important information. You don't want to put an ad on NPR if you're trying to attract mostly conservative public. I mean, they probably are. And if they are, they're going to not want to watch it because they heard about you on NPR. <laughs> right. But that gets to, you know, people are kind of climate change. Like, oh, you know, it really depends on. Okay, we got to move along. This, you, you guys are great. I love this. You've got lots of questions and input and everything, but I'm going to have to move us along because we're getting we're running out of time. Here's your demographics. Um, you know, we've got very few young, family, you know, young under 40 landowners. Um, 20% this is Connecticut, over 75 hit, hit New York. 10% in New York, so Connecticut's got a little bit more on the older side. But the bulk are, you know, in the thinking about retirement age, 55 to 65. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of questions that kind of get a little bit, a lot of that conservation ethic. So we ask uh, them to agree or disagree with this statement. So in Connecticut, about 80%, uh, and in New York's the next slide. Say they want their woodland to stay with 
Now, if you ask, if, would you sell at a reasonable price? Almost 20% said they would sell. These are not mutually exclusive. Somebody could want to sell for various reasons, but hope it stays intact and as a forest. Right? Um, but when you look at these um, acres, this is, so this is. Um, Yeah, we've been talking about so, uh, New York and then we went to the other one. But in Connecticut, this is almost 30% of the acres. That's a scary number. You know, we've been showing this number a lot to the DEP, Connecticut Forest and Park Association, people like that. This number scares them. It's like, wow, this is a lot of land. Now, the market has to be right and everything, you know. But, okay. New York, we've got uh, the conservation ethic, as indicated by this, is higher by 10% and the, the interest in selling is lower by 10%. So okay, so this you're going to have this uh, for your states when you go to your work groups. Um, all right, I'm going to... Okay, very quickly, one more thing I need to do. You can Credits to Brett Butler and his... his <laughs> all right. Um, Passing credits to <laughs> fast moving credits. So quickly, uh, part of us going to talk about uh, our segmentation by landowner attitudes and values, reasons for owning their land, but I'm going to talk about one other and very briefly analysis we did, which is called the, um, which is used a lot by marketers. And they divvy their world up into four categories. And on a scale, this would be engagement, this would be activity. So, people are highly, high levels, no, I'm sorry, I keep getting this, this is stewardship, let's call this a stewardship ethic. So people have a very high stewardship ethic and highly engaged, lots of activities. We know all these guys, right? Model owners. They have conservation easements, they have stewardship plans, they come to your workshops, uh, they members of the land trust, they go on your woods walks. We know those guys. And that's roughly, depending on where you are, five to ten percent usually. Can we get some of those lights on back here? So oh yeah, okay, sure. <coughs> Um, on the other end of the scale, low stewardship ethic, low level of activity, you know, these write-ups. <laughs> I don't want anybody telling me what to do with my land. If you're the government, I'm going to show up with a gun at the border and you better get off my land. I know what I'm doing. You got it. These can be, it varies, but around 15%. Uh, the way the product market to see this is, okay, these guys, I'm selling Tom's and Maine toothpaste. They're always going to buy Tom's and Maine toothpaste. No matter what, right? These guys are never going to buy it. What? No, because it's, it's never the cheapest thing on the shelf. Right? Okay, we have another category. High activity, low stewardship ethic. These we call opportunists. And they, I don't know, they can be around 20%. You can buy that eight after the after one year when you're done. Um, they'll buy Times of Maine if it's cheaper than Christ or whatever else. They buy whatever's on sale this week. And they may be happy to buy your brain right now, but it's only because it's on sale. So these might be people who, um, they are participating in a cost share program because they're really interested in timber and it's paying for them to do a timber stand improvement and it's going to get them more income for their um, for their timber sale when they have it. But if those financial benefits go away, they're going to forget about the stewardship plan. They're just going to do whatever is the most financially viable for them. So that's a good way to think about those those people, options. And then you have the rest of them, which is usually about 65 to 70 percent. What would you call these guys? Good guys. Why are they good guys? What are they high on? Ethics, stewardship ethic, right? What are they low on? Doing it. 
<laughs> right. So these are all, the only thing we want you to take away from here, these are called prime prospects. And this, about, this percentage is pretty valid throughout the whole, every state, really. Whatever you do, if you're able to reach these people with the right messages, with the right hooks, at the right time, and all those good things Karima talked about, they're receptive. You have a large receptive audience out there if you can reach them right, with the right things. Because you've got a lot of people with high stewardship ethic who are really not doing anything. They don't have management plans, they're, you know, they don't have a stewardship plan, they've never talked to a land trust. They love the wildlife on their property, but they've never done anything to actually improve it, or maybe they're doing something to hurt it, because they don't really know that, because they're taking firewood out, which means all the dead wood on the ground is coming out for firewood. Um, that, that, those are your fine prospects. So that's, you know, we don't, there's a lot of science behind this, but we don't want to get into that, because it can tend to confuse people. Um, so anyway, this is just the message. Whatever you do, if you do it well, you got a large audience out there. <coughs> So, I'm sorry, one question. Sure. So, to tie this four quadrant model back to some of the things you said, what are two or three questions in your survey that point to those targets? Uh, they have to do with reasons for owning land. We took this, this came from the reasons for owning land, uh, what they're doing on their land, primarily those two questions, those questions related to those things, what their future plans are, what they're currently doing, their reasons for owning land. And we took the various ways that those are answered and we were able to put people in these four categories. Okay. 